What's going on in the labour market? Just explain it for us. Well, I think you're asking the right question on where, where are the workers. If you think about this in terms of the supply and the demand, the demand piece, we've got really strong vacancies, and that's been driven by actually a really strong economic recovery. Um, and also the fact that there's a lot of industries that are reopening and, and in particular in hospitality, obviously, and retail too, that are struggling to, to get people back in their jobs. But on the supply side, we've seen a really big fall in the number of people in the labour market. And we estimate the labour market is about one million people smaller. There's a million fewer people in the labour market now than you would have expected on the pre-crisis trends, which were of, of a growing labour market, of more people in the labour market. And that million, that breaks down about between a quarter and a third of that is probably lower migration. So people are talking about you know, Brexit and, and movement restrictions as being the main factor. I mean, it's a factor, but it's not the main one. The rest of it is explained by fewer older people in the labour market, particularly people over 50 and particularly older women, um, and fewer young people. And that's mainly young people going into education and particularly young men. So we kind of got problems on the demand side and also on the supply side, but it means this is probably the tightest labour market that we've, that we've seen in about 40 or 50 years. This has been, we've never had this many um, vacancies for the number of job seekers we've got. We've also got, haven't we, Tony, that, that's very well explained, I thought. We've also got, haven't we, what economists call regional and occupational mismatch. So a lot of the vacancies require higher skills or they may be in parts of the country yeah. where the workers aren't or if the workers are there they may not have the requisite skills obviously hgv drivers is a very very obvious example but it's right across the board manufacturing even customers facing roles yeah that's right and um and that's what i think policymakers are grappling with are these labour shortages? There aren't enough people. Are they skill shortages or skills mismatches that, um, that the, the people are there, but they don't have the right skills? Or is it a bit of both? I mean, the reality is it is, you know, inevitably, these things are always a bit of both, aren't they? But the skills mismatches piece, HGV drivers exemplifies it really well. But you see it as well in health services, for example. So health and social care has got really high, about 170,000 vacancies in health and social care. You, just, you can't just walk in off the street and start you know, working on a hospital ward or working in a care home. Um, so people have to have the right skills. And of course, a lot of people do have those skills, but they're not working in those jobs. And drivers is a good example of that. You know, there's a lot of HGV drivers who are working, um, um, who, who, who are working in other trades, who, who used to work in it and have moved out of it, particularly older, older people. Um, so how we get people back into those jobs is skills mismatches, but it's also getting labour markets functioning properly. Often people can't move, you know, it's hard to move home, for example, because, of, because if you've got a mortgage or if, because of housing markets you know, and the cost, of, the cost of moving home and so on, there can be all sorts of reasons that are holding it back. But, you know, come back to the point, we've never had it this, this tough, actually, for filling vacancies. In some ways, it's a nice problem to have. You know, the jobs are, are there now. But we've got to get a lot better, government and firms, at helping, pe helping get people in the right places, in the right jobs. And if older workers, you, you said specifically older women, actually, if they don't want to be in the labour market and if yeah. young people or students don't want to, to, to take mm. up jobs, then like, what, what can public policy do about that? What do we do about it? No, exactly. And actually, what's driven that? But, so one of the in really interesting things that we found looking at this in the last, last few weeks, last month or so, has been that a large part of that gap for older women is women aged over 65, actually. So it's people who, um, men aged over 65 too, but, but more so women. And a lot of those jobs, the biggest falls in jobs have been things like part-time jobs in retail and, and in cleaning, for example. Um, and those jobs aren't necessarily going to come back. And, um, and those people may decide that they don't want to um, go and work in social care or, um, or work in, a, in another retail job or, or in hospitality, for example. But, but I think the bigger problem, actually, is that there's a whole load more people. There's a lot more people. There's 6 million people who are aged 16 to 64, and they've either got a long-term health condition, they're looking after family members, or they're a student. And about 1.5 million of those say they want to work, but they're not looking for work. And so there's still a lot more we can do, I think, to get that labour pool growing, if you like, bring more of those people into the labour market. And that means firms offering jobs in a different way, being more flexible, being more open, that they're open to employing older people, offering more training on the job, more job security, for example. But it also means our sort of employment services like Job Centre Plus and our other employment services have to get better at reaching those people and helping them to prepare for work and get the skills they need to work and then get into those jobs. So you're right, many of the people who've left work aren't going to go back, unfortunately. But there are plenty of people here who we could be working better with to fill those jobs.
Tony, just before you go, let me ask you this. So the furlough scheme has only just ended at the end of last month. We think there are around 1.2, 1.3 million people on furlough, maybe a few more. Yeah. We don't yet know how many of those furloughed people are returning to jobs or if they're being laid off. We won't know that until we see unemployment numbers for September and October in a few mm. months' time. But what's your sense? Unemployment looks very, very low at the moment. But is your sense that most of those furloughed workers have gone back to at least part-time or maybe full-time employment? Yeah. Yes, it is, yeah. And I, I'm, I'm quite optimistic about this, actually. I, I, think the, I think the data that was out yesterday, which is survey data from the, from the Labour Force survey, but it's a very large survey, suggests that we're very few people, a, a few hundred thousands, and that's still a lot of people, clearly, but, but, but compared with the many millions that some of the administrative data is telling us, um, the survey data is suggesting there were probably about 300,000 people who were still fully off work um, and were, were furloughed in effect during August. And I think that's probably fallen again during September. And by the time where we are now in October, obviously there's no one left furloughed. But I would say this, you know, there's no sign yet of any increase in redundancies, none at all. If you, if you, if you look on Google Trends, look at what people are Googling, they're not Googling redundancies. So that, that's a good sign because that was a really important indicator in the early crisis. And there's been no surge. We know this from talking to people in Job Centre Plus DWP. There's been no surge in the number of people claiming universal credit over the last few weeks. So there's no suggestion um, so far that furlough is going to lead to higher unemployment. It, it is going to affect people's incomes, though. You know, there was over a million people getting more money through, through the furlough scheme um, uh, you know, over the last few months. And now they're not. So you combine that with the reduction in universal credit, with higher energy bills, with rising prices, rising inflation. Um, you know, that, that, that's a problem, I think. But, but I'm not expecting that we'll see unemployment rise. If we paid people more in the hard to recruit sectors yeah. and gave them better employment rights, would we nail the problem? Um, possibly unemployment rights would, would, might help on pay to an extent, maybe. But um, I mean, obviously, pay is really important in this. But I think... You know, a lot of the research says the reasons why people who've got a long term health condition and aren't working don't go back to work isn't because a job's paying eight pounds ninety instead of nine pounds twenty or nine pounds thirty. You know, it's because the shifts are, are long and at their times they can't do because the employer isn't able to offer them the support in work because they haven't received the support they need through health services because they may not have the skills they need for that job. There's a whole load of other things we can do. Pay matters. I mean, it really does. Clearly it does. But there's a whole load of other things we can do. If we're thinking about how do we help people with health conditions, disabled people um, and people who are long term unemployed back into work, you know, it's, this isn't all about pay. There's many other things that firms could be doing to think about how they make jobs more attractive, easier to fill and, and how they support people better in work. Now, if you're a disabled person in, in, in this country, you're twice as likely to be out of work as somebody who's not disabled. And, and that's been the case for, for decades. You know, and that isn't that shouldn't be the case. That isn't the case in many other countries. So we can do far better at helping people back into work. And this isn't just about how much you pay. It's about how it's about how we help people in work and help people prepare for work. Tony Wilson, director of the Institute for Employment Studies. What a fabulous contribution. We've learned a huge amount. 100 percent. Thanks a lot for joining us on on GB News. We're debating where are the workers amidst record high vacancies here in the UK? Let's now talk to Mark Fells, director of the HGV Recruitment Centre. Mark, we know because we read and constantly hear how tough it is uh, because of the HGV uh, shortage, driver shortage. What do we do to sort that shortage out? Gosh, that's a big question. Um, so we know what we've tried to do. We've tried to offer visas for people to come back and we know that's not working. Uh, we are trying to sort out um, a better training cycle for people to train. But, you know, the big reality for me, and as I've expressed a few times, we get quite heavily involved with newly qualified drivers, is that we receive um, so many inquiries. And I actually know of a company quite recently that um, offered to pay for people's training who simply couldn't afford to do so. They had 50 spaces available and they had 5,000 inquiries. So um, we know the visa issue is not going to solve the issue. We know that we're not going to be able to train enough people quick enough to get them back into work. So I think if we want to look at this long term, we've got to understand we've got a community of people that do want to get into sector, but simply can't afford to do so. So I think there's got to be a conversation with government that accesses some form of student loan funding 
that can allow people to get into the sector that want to, but simply at the moment can't afford to do so. Mark, you're almost becoming a GB News correspondent. You're often on the channel and we're really lucky to have you. You're at the coalface. You're the clearinghouse, you and your competitors in the industry for HGV drivers. I was just discussing in the previous hour, Jeremiah, on The Money Show, that the huge port of Felixstowe in Suffolk now, Maersk, which oversees about a third of shipping into this country. They're not actually using Felix Stowe in some cases now. They're going, they're delivering goods for the UK to the continent and then getting them trucked over because there is such a shortage of HGV drivers. There's a backlog of containers at Felix Stowe. They're running out of space. This is getting more serious, isn't it? Rather than less serious. I, I totally agree. And this is something that I think um, I realised actually the other day is if you consider as discussed, that the pool at the moment simply isn't growing. If anything, I still believe there are more people that are leaving than than potentially joining at the moment. And if we consider that the pool isn't growing, what we're doing is putting those that are still working under extraordinary stress. People are being asked to work longer hours. It's even more stressful a job than it was pre-pandemic. So my worry is that we get through Christmas and people get gas back in their cars and turkeys on their table. But I think what we'll see next year is um, an aging population. So we know the average age of a driver is 55. We know that we're working them way harder than we did before. So I actually worry that as we move into next year, this problem, this 100,000, is actually going to increase before it starts to decrease. And that's a massive concern. In the um, medium term, what can you do to make the job more attractive. Some people say if you made the job more attractive, if it was shorter hours, if it was better paid, if it wasn't such long periods away from home, then you would be, it, you, the, the job would be attractive because, because people would want to work in, in, in your sector. Well, I think, as, as discussed earlier, the first thing we can do is make it easier for people who wish to join to join by allowing access to some form of funding to get in. But, you know, it's well documented that the conditions in the UK are not as good as mainland Europe. Uh, I've said before that I am seeing conditions change in in the depots where people work, uh, how we're treating people is improving. But we've also got massive infrastructure, sorry, challenges across our service stations and our laybys. And until we start to address the working conditions and improving those in a really significant way, it's, it's hard to see how people are going to sort of want to join because it's not just down to money you know yes wages are going up and that can only be a good thing for those that are either staying in sector returning or wishing to join but it's it's not as black and white as just money i think we've really got to look at the infrastructure and how we can improve that and if we can start to make the working job more palatable for people easier for people to do their job during the working day i think we'll start to see more people coming to sector but as i said my bigger worry is that we are speaking to thousands of people that want to join but simply can't afford to do so. And, you know, this is a physical job. You know, it's not just driving A to B and, un, and, and dropping off your consignment. You are often required to do several drops a day. Sometimes those drops involve cage delivery or manual handling if you're taking, for example, a kitchen up three flights of stairs. So it's very, very physical work. Um, and we've got to, I believe, open this conversation that allows a younger community and it is the younger community that are struggling more to find this three four thousand pounds to actually get the license and and find ways to get people who want to do the job doing the job me as odd mark just listening to you there it costs three to four thousand pounds to for for, you know fees up front to pay and train an hgv driver so the government will give you a student loan to go to a university to study a subject that may have nothing to do with the career you end up taking, but they won't fund a young person to do an HGV licence. That seems back to front. It it is, and if you'll indulge me with some statistics from the parliamentary website, I I researched this recently, and at the moment we uh, we lend students to the tune of £17.17 billion every single year. That current debt uh, to the UK is one hundred and 41 billion pounds and that's projected to rise to half a trillion by the middle of this century as i said all statistics from the government website so we're looking at massive student loan student debt and to go and train 30,000 new young people who i know for sure want to join our sector would cost 
I know still a lot of money, 100 million pounds. Now that 100 million pounds is less than 1% of what we lend to students annually. And to me, there's a huge disconnect here because as I said, I know for fact, people want to join. I can give numerous examples of this and simply they can't afford to do so. So we're, we're funding students 17 billion a year. Let's go find less than 1% of that to fix this problem in the long term. Can you train young people, Mark? Uh, yes, we can. So, I mean, I know of 18, 19, 20 year olds that are now behind a lorry and doing well. You know, as soon as you've got your license, you are able to drive. There may be insurance challenges with people that young, but, you know, this is, I think there's 2% of drivers are under the age of 25 in our sector at the moment. And as we know, uh, the average age is 55. There's, there's, there's a massive gulf here. And, and as I said, it is physical work and we need to do everything we can. I'm actually with uh, Chris Grayling, the ex-Transport Secretary, at an event this weekend, and I'll be doing my very best to talk to him about this because I think something has to change. What do you reckon to Keir Starmer's uh, skills in, in the HGV sector? <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I think, I think anything we <laughs> can do... Don't give up the day job. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I missed you there. We were, we were chatting over you. Did, you. did you get a thumbs up from, from you? <laughs> Well, well, look, I think anything we can do to, to improve the skill sector yeah. is a good thing. But, you know, it, it's a much bigger conversation. And, you know, I, and, I, and I thank you guys, because most of the time, I think the platform is, is projecting people are interested because they can't put gas in their cars. And soon uh, I, I predict a large run on, on turkey sales and Brussels sprouts. But, you know, when people have had their Christmas dinner and they've got the fuel to drive to their families for Christmas, I can assure you, as I said earlier, this is going to get worse before it gets better and a bigger conversation needs to be had as to how we fix this long time otherwise sadly we'll all be sat here talking about this this time next year and it is a it is a worry and we've got to um, lobby government we've got to try and find ways to bring younger people in because the training cycles are taking longer we know we're not going to bring more foreign drivers back so therefore bringing new people in you know jobs for english people which was what we all voted on for brexit there's got to be a, a better way for us to be able to facilitate that because Simply put, we can't ask a 25-year-old to suddenly find three, four thousand pounds that they don't have. And I know the government is saying this is industry's fault. Uh, it, this is industry's uh, problem to solve, and and industry now is paying more money. But you know, hauliers, transport companies do run on tight margins, and we can't expect them to single-handedly go and front up this money. And as we know with student loans, this is paid back at source from paycheck. So the government will get their money back. 30,000 people working contributes nearly a billion pound a year in additional revenue. Um, I'm struggling to see the arguments against this, against this at the moment. Last question, Mark, briefly. It's often been reported, you can tell me if it's fair or not, that DVLA, the licensing agency, has been dragging its heels, maybe because of working from home during the pandemic or whatever. Are DVLA, in your view, they're not here to defend themselves, but are they, in your view, as an industry practitioner, still a bottleneck well we're hearing horror stories of people that are applying for provisional licenses and waiting 12 13 14 weeks to get that back without that they can't even get um, their provisional license to begin the practical training so yes there are very serious issues and um, and we, we wrote to loads of people asking them to come back to sector uh, that letter has been quite successful but what we have to realize is that People don't have all of the qualifications required to come back. And one of those elements is CPC, which, Liam, I think we've spoken about before. Yeah. Um, I think we need to see um, either embargo CPC for six months to a year or, or make it much easier for people to get back into vehicles. Because even from the letters, we're seeing loads of people who want to return, but they don't have all the necessary qualifications. And anything we can do to ease that process, to cut through red tape, is going to get more people in vehicles, which is, you know, at the very least going to make a small dent in this crisis as we run up to Christmas. Mark Fells of the HGV Recruitment Centre, thanks as ever for your contribution. Cheers. Welcome to the GB News YouTube channel. You can watch us live 24 hours a day, catch up on your favourite shows and join in the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and you'll never miss any of our exclusive content.